this talk, um, I'm going to give it over to my uh, hand the reins over to my colleague in a second. Uh, this talk is intended to help shift perspective a bit um, and um, hoping that uh, our goal is to get you to talk after the talk, uh, plant some seeds and that sort of thing. Um, it's also likely that, um, uh, well, we're hoping, fingers crossed, that it will generate some, some good discussion in Q&A and that sort of thing. Um, so with that, um, Richard, would you like to Thanks, take the reins? John. Um, this is a talk about incidents um, and primarily focused on incidents and the tooling related to them. But uh, it's broadly applicable to a variety of different kinds of situations in which people use tooling. We've really focused on the incidents. Um, let me um, conclude by saying, uh, there's basically um, just a few things that we wanna say. One is that above the line and below the line are two different things. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. Do some observations on tooling. Most of the tooling that exists is below the line. So we'll be talking primarily about that. We're gonna make a claim that the above the line tool space is actually sparsely populated at present, but that that is changing fairly rapidly. We expect that in an incident space near you, there's going to be more ATL tooling available to you in the future. What would be ATL tooling? What would we use ATL tooling for in incidents? We'll give you three kinds of cases. Um, and uh, we'll end with a little warning about the risks of clumsy automation as we try to bring more tooling into the intra incident space. I'm going to start out with above the line, below the line. Some of you will recognize this uh, picture, but the idea here is a relatively straightforward one. Uh, we, when we talk about systems, are talking mostly in our daily discussions about the kinds of machinery that exists below this line of representation that you see uh, represented by the green screens here. Uh, we talk about uh, monitoring tools and the organizing tools and the various bits of the technology stack and how that works, or in the case of incidents, how that sometimes fails. Um, we're also uh, interested in the way that this appears. And basically, we don't see below the line. We only see above the line through the, the advantage of these, these screens is here the representation of what we are able to actually access telling us about the systems that we have is basically the screens that we look at. We don't actually see what's going on below the line that's not accessible to us in a direct sensory sort of way. We only see representations of that. Now, a consequence of this, of course, is that everything that we know or claim to know about systems that we work with is actually a set of inferences that we make from the representations that are available to us. We really don't get to see below the line. If I were to take you to the data center in which your, your programs are running and show you the racks of computers, you would not be able to point to that one and see there's my code in operation. But we don't very often talk much about these inferences or how they're made. We treat it very much as though that stuff below the line is actually really existing there. We, we, we talk about it as though it has some real uh, 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 physical existence, despite the fact that what we're really talking about is our inferences that we get from our various kinds of representation tools. Now, what's above the line consists of the work that people are do, doing, and cognition is a fancy word for what's in the mind and activities of the mind. That includes the observing, inferring, anticipating, planning, troubleshooting, diagnosing, all those things that are related to the systems, uh, components of this system that is below the line. And we have the ability ourselves to observe a variety of things that uh, allow us to carry out work in collaboration with others. Almost everything that we do is collaborative and we can observe the actions, the speech, the gestures, uh, clicks and signals and so on that are coming from other people. Uh, and use that to coordinate the work uh, that we are doing. Almost all the work that is done in these systems is done in some sort of collaborative uh, fashion. There's always communication going on up there. 
this is a tool. A tool, this particular case is a case of a hammer. It's, uh, by the way, these uh, diagrams or drawings or, or photos are taken from Wikipedia. Um, here is a hammer. It's a piece of wood on the end of a stick that has been obviously used for a very long time to, uh, uh, to uh, pound on various things. Now, what's interesting about this is that the, the tool, this tool thing lends itself to manipulation as distinct to a machine that's got automatic action. A tool is something that we apply to accomplish different things, not always what was the intention of the people who made this thing. It's got many, many different uses. By the way, we get better at using tools over time. As we become more skilled with a particular tool, it becomes more accurate. The activities we do are more accurate. They're more automatic in the sense that we don't have to think about them as much as we're using the tool. These are comments that were made very long ago by Lewis Mumford in his book, Techniques and Civilization, um, but, but they still apply to tools today. By the way, one of the things that is fascinating about tools is that they take on the characteristics of their owner. Over time, the handle of this hammer is worn into the distinct shape of the person who's wielding it. And that constant rubbing and friction shapes the handle into something that fits the hand of the individual owner. This is probably something that you experience with the tools that you use, a favorite screwdriver or pliers or something like that. The idea is that the tools take on the characteristics of their owners, unlike machines, which tend to be the same, no matter who is using it, uh, they produce uh, always the same kind of function. By the way, a successful tool will spawn the generation of many other tools. Revisions and extensions create new and specialized tools over time. So you will find that there are many versions of hammer. In fact, if you look, you can find probably 40 or more different kinds of hammers available. And, and interestingly enough, the crafts that use these hammers are marked by the specialized tool sets that reflect their workers' needs. Each one of these hammers is different from the other. It's used for a different purpose. And although they all have that hammerness about them, they are actually quite crafted and designed and, and, and specified to, to uh, perform very specific functions rather than the generic function of hammer. I'm going to turn this over to John. So uh, many of you in the audience might be familiar with a, with a tool called Top. We would, in our framing, think of Top as a hammer. Um, now, in, in the case of the tools that, that many of us use on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, including during incidents, which Richard will touch on a little bit later, there are at least two aspects to them. The first is they tend to be opinionated um, and they're opinionated in a couple of different ways. The top uh, has this sort of default representations, right? So it's, a, it's a, uh, an aggregate of live system metrics. You'll see that all oh, the top five and that's sort of global within the instance or the you know, server or the machine, the container, whatever, uh, that are updating, right? Uh, and it might update at some sort of default uh, uh, rate. Um, it's also as part of its design in a table that has a, a, a defined, and again, comes with some defaults. You can change those, but there's some default um, columns, which are sortable um, and, uh, and, and have some, you can add and subtract or so. But for the most part, if you just run top, you're gonna get something like this. So in that way, the tool is opinionated. The author of top, uh, certainly the original author had a, had a, a, a picture in their mind of what they would want this tool to be useful for. The second aspect of tools like this is that they are not prescriptive. Now, what you'll note is that there's no claims about what this data that it's displaying and refreshing actually mean. And as Richard alluded to, 
uh, what we often do, and especially those who will, you'll just, I mean, run top as muscle memory, you might not even remember that you ran it, especially during an incident, because you're looking for something, you're using the tool. The tool, uh, in this case, doesn't provide uh, guidance and judgment about what's good or bad. We could argue that, well, the fact that it's sortable and, uh, um, and top, Right uh, uh, um, on on one, some of these uh, some of these columns has a bit, but not really. It doesn't really tell you what's good or bad, and and it 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 makes no claim about them. Uh, it also um, is is built so that you don't have to do anything. You certainly can uh, and make some adjustments. Uh, I don't know if I know more than uh, uh, you know two or three keystrokes uh, without having to look it up um, on top. But uh, so there's certainly lots possible, but it's not prescriptive in that it provides guidance for you. Next. So what this, uh, what this is a description of is a below the line tool. It represents aspects, um, in this case, uh, oh, a finite set of metrics about uh, resource usage, uh, about what's going on down below, down below the line. Next. So uh, when, we, when we look at tools like, uh, like TOP, um, they're just like hammers. And I want to refer to you uh, to what Richard said, tools uh, uh, tend to spawn uh, variations, certainly successful tools. And I'm sure you all might be aware, just like hammers, there's A top, G top, H top, V top. I remember when H top uh, became a thing. I'm old enough to remember that. And what metrics on a per core? What? Uh, wow, that's amazing. I can't believe it. And so this is the type of, uh, uh, this is an example using top of a useful, uh, of a tool that has usage wide enough that others will uh, uh, refine and or in, in, interject new or different types or, 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 or variations of those, uh, of those opinionated representations. The point that we wanna get at here is that all of these tools, the example here on the left amongst all of the tops represent what's happening below the line. And in fact, there's, there's a, a myriad plethora uh, of these tools. The question that that we're trying to set up here is what is above the line and what might be able to help us. Richard, back to you. Yeah, it turns out that above the line tools are, are pretty sparse. Um, we've got a few of those around. Um, the most obvious one is IRC uh, and, and it's in, in its various manifestations. And indeed it has some of those uh, similarities of a uh, uh, to other successful tools in the sense that it spawned specialized versions for various things like Slack and Teams. There are some incident accounting tools that we have that have been developed that help us uh, keep track of some things. And you should ask the vendors in the hall. I'm sure they'll make some statements about what they have. But there is actually very little that helps us understand what is going on above the line in terms of tooling that gives us representations of what's happening there. It's really quite remarkable. Whereas the uh, below the line tooling was filled with hundreds, literally hundreds of examples of tools that are, exist and are used in various forms. The number of tools that apply to above the line is actually very limited. Maybe that's not a bad thing. Why would we want to bother with above the line tools? What difference would it possibly make? Well, in fact, we, we, we can get some benefits from looking at these things. And one of those is, is if you just take the old IRC as an example, uh, 
you can find that, that there is a lot of status information displayed here. For example, if you look at the list on the right-hand side, you can see who's in this particular channel. Uh, you can see some of the permissions that they have, some of the specialized functions that may be performed there. It's, it's actually a, a display of what the current state of this above the line world is as well as being a communication device that allows you to look back and forth at these uh, across this uh, collection of communications that are happening in the channel. Uh, I want to make the point again that lots of the currently uh, existing ATL focused apps sort of piggyback on IRC and its offshoots as the basic underlying tool. There are modifications in, in one fashion or another of that tool, even if they're uh, 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 largely uh, developed from scratch in a technical way, they still maintain this kind of basic notion of IRC as a conversation about which we are pay paying it to which we can pay attention over time. What uses could ATL to tooling have? Well, here's an example of an incident, and you see that I've I've been pretty um, uh, loose about this, describing what constitutes an incident. There's a difference between the declared incident that uh, sometimes people will use a specific time, the start of and the end of thing. But, but in fact, incidents have much, much longer uh, 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 beginning and much longer tails than is generally described here. For instance, there's uh, the wind up to the incident, which is very often things getting a little uh, iffy looking. And then there's some troubleshooting that actually starts before the incident is fully declared. And the troubleshooting continues for a long time, even as recovery operations are beginning. And the unit, uh, the, the declaration of the end of the incident usually actually precedes the full recovery or, or at least the processes of watching what's going on and monitoring the system to make sure that it's recovered. And following on that, there's the sense making about what just happened to us in this incident, as well as follow on reviews. So there's lots of stuff that we could include in this collection of incident. But, but what would, what would would an ATL tooling do for us relative to an incident? Well, the first thing might actually be in a case of something that would happen before the incident. Someone might notice something that is going on and have the question, who knows about this thing that I'm looking at here and want to figure out who would be the contact person to talk to about this sort of thing. And this actually can happen quite early. Once the incident gets rolling, there are other questions that arise. Who needs to be aware of what's going on? Who do we need to give alerts to? Who is currently actually doing work on the issue? I would give you as an example, if you arrive in your incident communications channel, whatever device you use, and, and there's no one else there, could you claim that that's actually an incident? Uh, probably not. The incident hasn't started yet because nobody's gone to that channel or you're misinformed about where it is. Who can we call to help? This is a really important one, particularly as the incident goes on longer and longer. The question is, what resources do we have that we can bring to the table to help us deal with this incident? And as we bring those resources in, the question, who needs to come up to speed? There are people joining at various points throughout the incident. How do we bring those people up to an understanding of what the status is of the incident that we're working on? How do they get up to speed or spun up about what's going on in the incident? What decisions are pending is something that we often want to talk about because people will come in and say, you know, what are the options? What do we choose from? How do we know what decisions are actually on the table? What is, what is it that tells us what the choices that are available to us are? And after the incident is formally over, we ask questions about what people did and uh, understand at the time and what they've been doing during the incident. That happens both in our immediate sense making, where we just say, wow, that was a terrible incident. That, that was really tough what was going on there. And in the more formal reviews, it take time to reconstruct the incident, and try and understand more about it. These are all functions that above the line tooling could help us with, but there are many, many more. If you imagine that one of the things that becomes important is coordinating work across teams, then 
coordinating and knowing that we're in, in stages of coordination become very important. If we send people off or groups off to, to investigate issues, the fact that those investigations are pending is actually very important to keep track of. And we'd like to know where they are in that progress. If people are splitting off and going into side channels, we'd like to have opportunities for them to come back and advise us about what they found there, but that requires coordination and an understanding of how the incident has progressed since that time. And by the way, this is the simplest of pictures. In long running incidents, we get into the whole issue about how we're going to hand over all of the different activities that are going on above the line to other groups and how we're going to keep that in coordination. This is a space that we expect above the line tooling to occupy. And it's a space that's only poorly uh, occupied by the tooling that currently exists. There's not a great deal out there to help us. One of the things that comes up as we're trying to think about tools that come that we might use here is what we were going to call the workload problem. And this is a really serious problem that dogs any attempt to produce above the line tooling. If you imagine that there's a workload that occurs during the course of the incident, it starts out as pretty low. Nothing's really happening. The workload related to the incident is very low. And then somebody takes a look and uh, says, oh, gee, there's something unusual here. And this might occur many times before an incident actually occurs. It's if we're looking at the system and trying to explain its behavior. But eventually some a group of people become aware of things that are going on and the workload rises dramatically and suddenly to be uh, very fever pitched. You get very high workload going on and that workload can be sustained at a very high level for a quite a long period of time, well into the recovery and extending to the recovery and beyond the end of the formal declared incident. Indeed, it only tapers off, sorry, forgive me, two, two hits. It only tapers off uh, after we get into the sense making and review time and it gradually uh, fades out and people are very concerned about workload in the middle of this time, which brings us to the point I want to make about uh, a problem that we face with with uh, clumsy automation. That is one of the problems that we have is we try to build tooling to fit into our incident management processes is this bugaboo of clumsy automation. Uh, the term was developed by Earl Wiener uh, back in, in 89, uh, talking about the human factors of, uh, at that time, what were called glass cockpit air aircraft and the extent of aviation automation in the cockpit flight deck. And basically clumsy automation is any automation that increases the workload at already high workload times and, and through, its, through the automated process decreases at low workload times. Wiener made the observation uh, and co-authors made the observation that most of the interactions with the uh, flight deck automation that would make the, the plane fly during the middle of the flight without any intervention took place at the highest workload times, that is during takeoff and landing. This is a real problem that exists as we develop automation. And we have this in spades in this problem of trying to develop intra-incident support. That is, if you look at where all of the density of those questions and our need for assistance in helping us get through the middle of the incident is, that's all in the intra-incident period when the workload is already at the highest. In the beginning, before the incident, and then the post-incident, the, the rate at which we are trying to ask questions and, the, and the, uh, uh, the urgency of asking questions is relatively lower, but so is the workload. It's much easier to do there. The problem that we face as we try and build this, a risk that is present in our attempt to, do, to adopt intra-incident tools is this clumsy automation problem. That is, if your automation to help you in the intra-incident period requires you to interact with that automation during the intra-incident period, it's clumsy. The whole point of having to do things to serve the automation, like giving it starts and stops and formulating messages and telling it who to do this and how to name that, all of that stuff is examples of clumsy automation because the period of time that the automation is asking for attention 
is a time when you're busiest trying to figure out what's going on and when the automation is supposed to be helping you. It's perhaps partly for this reason that some of the work that we've seen on trying to develop above the line tooling has been focused on pre and post incident tools. We've seen this particularly with works like Jelly and others like that, that uh, occupy the post incident space. The pre incident space is occupied by a variety of different kinds of monitoring and alerting sorts of things. Nagios would be an example and some of the other kinds of things, pager duty would be examples, but carrying this into the intra incident period is going to be much more challenging. It is a very important area to get the user interface to be of very low demand for attention. The automation is supposed to help us here, but if it demands attention, it's really uh, actually multiplying the problems that we face. And this is an area in which we expect to see substantial work, many experiments going on, Lots of people trying to build tools to help us here. Okay, so in conclusion, we have this. This ATL tooling idea is a new area. We don't see a lot of stuff there yet, uh, but, it, but it's clearly coming. We're beginning to watch what is going to be a tidal wave of new stuff that is really ATL tooling. It's coming soon to an incident near you. We see apps appearing, but few tools. If you think about that Mumford idea about the machine being different than a tool, the tool taking on characteristics of its owner and so on, tools are pretty easy to, to understand. They require very little attention and so on. The idea of that hammer and top being a hammer, we don't see a top equivalent tool yet in the intra-incident space, but stay tuned. A lot of people are working in this area and you're going to see a lot of this in the future. I, one thing I can guarantee is the next five years are going to see a revolution in what's going on in the above the line tooling in the intra-incident area. Indeed, John and I have been working on a tool in this area for some time. Another consequence uh, that we see here is that incident aiding is actually hard to do well. You see how difficult it is to answer those questions. There, it turns out the OS that exists down below the line is pretty static compared to the OS that exists above the line. The way that the system works, the, the procedures and policies, the organization of the, the, the system, the, the policies and processes that you use for solving incidents, very enormously. So building tools is going to be important, but building tools that people can make useful in their environment is going to continue to be challenging. It's, it's actually hard to do good aiding, especially when workload is very high. And by the way, there's plenty of opportunity out here for those of you who are tool makers. We expect that this is going to continue to be a very interesting area. And we encourage you to look forward and to think about tooling above the line is something that is coming soon to an incident near you. Thanks very much.